Namaste. Well, I tried to tell a story using Vedic mythological language, and I guess nobody got it. <laughs> See, all the Vedic stories are actually metaphors about consciousness and the process of self-realization and waking up and, you know, the whole thing. But anyway, I'm going to have to retell my story on a more literal level. And of course, that's going to take more time. <laughs> but okay. I have been going through a deep reassessment of my past. And the reason I have gone through that is because I had re remained dissatisfied with the explanations to myself about my own enlightenment. And long story short, I reawakened an old memory from back in the 60s. And I realized I had attained enlightenment in 1967 in San Francisco in the middle of an acid trip, LSD trip. And because at the time I had no mental structures, well, the enlightenment is a complete absence of mental structures anyway. <laughs> but I mean, even afterwards, <laughs> coming out of it, I had no ontology uh, to explain my experience. So I covered it up. I hid it from myself. And I went through the last, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years thinking, oh, I'm still working on it. I'm still trying to attain enlightenment. It's still in head of me, in front of me. It's in the future. No. Actually, it was in the past. But because I had no background, I had no ontology, no terminology, no framework with which to explain the experience to myself even, I buried it. And that led to so many problems I don't even want to get started telling the story about that. But the happy ending is that now I remember. And that leads me to speculate. I'll, I'll be frank, I'm, I'm speculating. I'm not at all sure this is true, but I would guess there are thousands of people like me who, by force of circumstances, whether through a drug trip or a life experience or just some happenstance, their own karma or whatever, were put in a position where the only way they could respond to what was happening to them was to attain their original state, enlightenment. But because of having no background, no preparation, no guidance, no support, they were unable to recognize what it was. Indeed, their friends, so-called friends, may have gone, uh, put them into denial about it, may have uh, told them that they were crazy, 
maybe even took them to a psychiatrist or got them committed, saying that they were delusional or whatever. And psychiatrists are some of the craziest people in this world. Don't ever let one get a hold of you if you can avoid it. So, the problem with being enlightened and not realizing what you are, or not being able to articulate your experience, what you're going through, how you see things, the danger is that you will be perceived in some other way. People around you will project on you that you're crazy, that you're, you're mentally or emotionally ill, that you're dysfunctional, autistic, or whatever, you know. They come up with all kinds of rationalizations for someone who sees things differently than they do. And of course, the so-called spiritual teachers and organizations in this world will be the last ones to recognize your enlightenment. Because after all, it's their job to teach you. Uh, and they expect you to support them financially so they have a business interest, a commercial interest in your not being enlightened. And they'll just explain it away somehow or other and say, but you really need to sign up for our next workshop. What to speak of therapists and people like that? Very dangerous people. Because they make money as long as you are crazy, as long as you are in pain. As long as you're suffering, they have a customer. But if you reach enlightenment, I mean, that's the end of suffering. That is the end of all mental structures. As we have just gone through in the previous series on emptiness, when one reaches the highest level, he realizes that all mental states are fabricated Without exception, all mental structures are false. Then he wakes up. There's something deep down inside of all of us, which I compare to a white lion. I use the image of a white lion very deliberately. That has enormous power for good, for love, for beauty. Enormous power. That's why in the story, the lion grows and grows and grows until he's bigger than the planet. Huh? He's holding, holding the earth in his paws, protecting her, guarding her loving her, caring for her. See, this is one of the paradoxical things about enlightenment, <laughs> is that you realize the world is false. And somehow that frees you to see its beauty and appreciate and love it more than you ever could. So it's two very important things I want to mention about this, is that recognizing an enlightenment experience for what it truly is, re-empowers the experience. It reignites the same catalytic power that whatever experience you had, whether it was a psychedelic experience or some other kind of experience, brought you to that point. And it reestablishes that consciousness 
as the foundation of your being. Of course, enlightenment is the foundation of everybody's being, but most people don't realize it and they don't have access to it. Actually, you could say, in one way, everybody's in this condition. That everybody is potentially enlightened. Everybody is a potential Buddha. But because they're in denial about their enlightenment, they can't access it, they can't enjoy it, they can't feel or use its power. But specifically, I want to target the people. And I know you're on this channel because I've read some of your uh, comments and recognized. <laughs> huh? I'm not going to name any names, but you know who you are. That you experienced something. Maybe you couldn't put a name on it, but it changed you profoundly and permanently. Made you something other than a human being, an ordinary human being, a putujana. I remember when I was a little kid, even when I was like four or five years old, I remember I got invited to one of the neighbor kids' birthday parties. And, you know, there was maybe, I don't know, a dozen or 20 kids there, roughly my age. And they were all doing what kids do, you know, nonsense. <laughs> and I was just standing there looking at them going, this is nonsense. This is a waste of time. What am I doing here? I felt profoundly alienated. I felt more comfortable around adults than I did around these kids. These kids were nonsense, man. But the, the kids' parents were worried about me. They thought I was depressed or something. No, I wasn't depressed. I was just naturally a very quiet, serious, sober kid. It's my nature. I was meditative by nature. And so naturally, when the suffering of life became overwhelming, where did I go? I took shelter in enlightenment. That was my nature. It's in my chart and everything. There's four moksha karakas in my chart. <laughs> But I had been thinking I would, I would attain enlightenment at the end of my life. But actually, I attained it in 1966. I was only 19 years old. So after that, I was, again, profoundly alienated. And I had to basically construct a persona to have to be able to function in the world at all. And that has continued since that time. And that persona has been more or less convincing, more or less dense, you know, densely manifested and at times completely transparent, and I could see the landscape within. Now I can feel it all the time. The lion is getting very big. <laughs> so, uh, almost out of time. This Project Ambal is for those who are spontaneously enlightened by whatever means, whether formal sadhana or just by life, to help you recognize who you are, what you are, and empower you to be everything that an enlightened being can be, which is actually something quite powerful. But the first step on the way to the, that manifestation, being that, 
is for you to recognize it and then to join with others who see the same thing. That's what this project is all about. Om Tat Sat. Buru Sardanai.